huge, huge topic. I can't think of a more difficult and frustrating and rewarding kind of photography. Now, as an astrophotographer, you're in a really small class of photographers who can, who can combine art with a deep scientific understanding of the skies. I'm going to spend the next series of videos trying to make that journey for you as easy as I can. Now, make no mistake, people spend their entire lives perfecting astrophotography techniques. It may take you months, it may take you years to really get an acceptable astrophoto. But the technology we have for backyard astrophotography today rivals what the pros were doing 20, maybe even 10 years ago. And there's people all across the internet who love to help you. So right now is the best time than ever to get into astrophotography. In this first video, I'm going to talk about your camera's eye on the skies, and that is the telescope itself. And I'll get into that after this message that helps support this YouTube channel. Let's first talk about the optical tube assembly, or OTA. Remember OTA because you'll hear it a lot. So that counts the telescope's tube, the optics inside, and the accessories, but not the mount. They have a couple main types of OTAs, reflectors and refractors. And which kind of telescope you choose for astrophotography depends on the cost, personal taste, uh, and exactly what kind of astrophotography you're going to be doing. First, let's take a look at how the different telescopes work, and then let's compare them uh, for astrophotography. And we'll start with the first kind of telescope ever invented, the refractor. Galileo didn't invent this kind of telescope, nor did he claim to, but he was one of the first we know of to point one at a celestial object and to write about it. Englishman Thomas Harriot probably beat Galileo to it, but it was Galileo who came to the conclusions based on what he saw to change how we see the universe by confirming Copernicus's sun-centered model. Refractors are the simplest of telescopes with a large lens called the objective, that's some jargon you will need to know, at one end of the tube collecting and focusing light onto your camera's sensor at the other end. The main job of a telescope isn't so much to magnify things, though they do do that. Their main job is to act like a light funnel, collecting the very few photons that most celestial objects deliver, and concentrating them for an eyepiece or your camera's sensor. The objective brings the light to a point of focus, and remember this jargon because it's important, called the prime focus. If you're doing visual astronomy by looking through an eyepiece, that's not where you put your eyepiece. Your eyepiece has its own focal length, and where the objective's prime focus is, is where you put your eyepiece's focus point at, and that's where you see an in-focus image with your eye. To do prime focus astrophotography, which is the only kind I do, you have no eyepiece, and instead put the camera's sensor at the prime focus. This will become really important later in this video. Refractors in Galileo's day had some pretty big problems. So in 1668, Sir Isaac Newton invented the first working reflecting telescope that used mirrors instead of lenses. And we call that kind of telescope today the Newtonian reflector, which you'll often see called a newt. With Newtonians, light travels down the tube and hits a concave mirror called the primary mirror. Instead of a lens, this mirror does the job of collecting and concentrating the light. Light then goes right back up the tube, but before it gets to its prime focus, concave mirrors have a prime focus just like lenses do, it hits a flat mirror at a 45 degree angle called the secondary mirror that bounces the light out to a hole in the side of the tube where you put your camera. Now, as you look at this diagram, you might think, doesn't the secondary mirror get in the way of what you're looking at? And the answer is, no, it doesn't. The simple reason is that it's completely out of focus. Now, I have my Newtonian setup tracking the moon, and there's the live display right on my laptop. So now what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to wave my hand across the telescope. And you can see it's making it flicker, but you can't see my hand because it's completely out of focus. The same thing's happening with the secondary mirror. Now, the secondary mirror is even casting a shadow on the primary mirror. And so there's the part in the middle of the primary mirror can't even see the moon. But that's okay because the other parts of the mirror can, and they make up for it. The uh, secondary mirror blocking does block some of the light, and it reduces the contrast of the image. This is something refractors don't suffer from. This is purely something for reflectors. This isn't the only kind of reflector you'll find at a retailer. Let's take a look at the Cassegrain. The modern Cassegrain configuration was published in 1672, a few years after Newton's reflector. It wasn't until much later that people figured out that the design probably came from French Catholic priest Laurent Cascarin. In the pure or classic Cassegrain, light enters the tube and hits a parabolic primary mirror at the back, just like the Newtonian. Light goes back up the tube where it hits a convex secondary mirror, not the flat mirror that a Newtonian has, that's pointed right back down the tube again where it goes through a hole in the primary. And you put your camera right behind the hole. You're not likely to find any classic Cassegrains at any retailer because their precise mirror shapes make them pretty expensive. But you will find loads of what are called catadioptric Cassegrains. Catadioptric meaning combining lenses and mirrors. And you'll find a couple of different kinds of catadioptric Cassegrains. Maxidoff Cassegrains and Schmidt Cassegrains. They both use spherical primary mirrors, which are cheaper to make than the parabolic ones. Spherical mirrors don't focus very well because they have what's called spherical aberration. To compensate for that, they use corrector plates at the front that light passes through first. These are lenses that bend the light only enough to compensate for spherical aberration. In fact, if you held one of these corrector plates, you probably couldn't even tell that they bend light at all. Now for the big question. Which one of these types of telescopes should you get for astrophotography? Now I can tell you right now, any of these three types of telescopes, Newtonian reflectors, refractors, and Cassegrains are great for astrophotography. But they each have their little issues that may make you prefer one over the other. Let's go over some of these issues, and on the way, let's go over some of the jargon that will help you understand what the experts are saying better. Refractors are the only one of these kinds of telescopes where a lens is the main light collecting piece. The main problem with lenses is they act like circular prisms. They bend light. And anytime you bend light, short wavelength blue light bends more than long wavelength red light. So you end up with color fringes around high contrast objects. Every photography enthusiast knows this with their regular lenses. And they use the same jargon for this, chromatic aberration. Now, fortunately, optics have come a long way since the time of Galileo. He and his compatriots used simple convex lenses for their telescopes, and they had horrible chromatic aberration. Later on, what's called the uh, achromatic lens was invented, and it's actually two lenses, one convex and one concave, put right next to each other. And this really reduced, but didn't eliminate, chromatic aberration. After that came the apochromatic lens, which you usually see as APO in ads. This kind of lens has three different lens elements, and along with extra low dispersion glass, which you'll usually see as ED, chromatic aberration in a good refractor today is very, very low. All right, now let's shop for a refractor telescope. Now Mead, uh, Celestron, Orion, and some others make really, really good refractors um, with all different price ranges. Uh, let's uh, start by looking at Celestron over at Celestron.com, and they have this Skywatcher series. And there you go, EDAPO. I'm going to say right now that when you're searching for a refractor for astrophotography, look for EDAPO. APO for apochromatic, remember? And ED for the extra low dispersion uh, glass. That'll give you the best best uh, images for your astrophotography. And Celestron has a series right here. And it looks like they have three telescopes in that series, plus um, one that's just the same as 
one of their other telescopes, but just on a mount. Uh, but let's look at this 100 millimeter one. Uh, you can see it's normally the um, uh, names of the uh, telescopes reflect the diameter of the telescope. So 100 millimeters, or the 100 ED is probably 100 millimeters. So let's take a look. Let's click on that. And here you go. The 100 ED, $749 US. It has a 100 millimeter aperture and a 900 millimeter focal length. So now let's talk about those numbers. Now when astronomers talk about aperture, they're talking about the diameter of the objective lens of a uh, refractor or the primary mirror of a refractor. Reflector. Now in this case, for this Celestron, this is 100 millimeters or about 4 inches, about that much. So it's pretty good size for a typical refractor. Now in general, the larger the lens or the larger the primary mirror, or generally, the larger the aperture, then the more light your telescope is collecting, the shorter the exposure you need, so the less chance for star trails you have to get that nice exposure. So generally you, you want to look for the widest aperture you can afford. Though wide apertures can also cause some problems that we'll look into later. Now the thing about refractors is that as their aperture gets bigger, the cost goes up really fast. Uh, so let's take a look at these uh, Celestrons. You can see here's this 80 millimeter for 649, this 100 millimeter for 749, then you go up to 120 millimeters for $1,550. So that's a pretty big jump. Let's take a look at another manufacturer. Uh, this is Vixen Optics, a very fine maker of refractors. Uh, here's one, it's an ED103, so that's probably about the same diameter, 100 millimeters. Let's take a look. And this one costs, what does it have? Actually, the cost was on the previous page, I think. This one costs $1,800, and their 80 millimeters is $700. And if we look at some of the numbers here, and this is an ED apochromatic refractor, so that's perfect. But uh, yeah, a low cost, a smaller uh, ED APO refractor is a very reasonable, very reasonable price. But you go up much bigger than that, you're paying some really big dollars. Now let's talk about the focal length of your telescope. Now just like with the camera lenses, the longer your focal length, the narrower your field of view. And so, in effect, the more magnification you get. Now for astrophotography, you might think you really want a lot of magnification all the time. But it really depends what you're trying to do. If you're photographing the planets, planets are really, really small in the sky. And they're pretty, uh, pretty bright, actually. So you're really, in that case, you're more interested in the focal length than you are the aperture of your scope. But if you do what I mostly do, which is um, deep sky photography of neb nebula and planets, or sorry, <laughs> nebula and galaxies and um, uh, star clusters, there, those are really dim, but they're actually pretty big in the sky. The uh, Andromeda galaxy is twice the diameter of the full moon. So in that case, you're really looking for a scope with a wide aperture, and you may not be all that concerned about the uh, focal length. So now, if we look at the Celestron, this uh, 100 millimeter aperture, 900 millimeter focal length, that's pretty typical for a telescope, uh, a refractor telescope around this price. So $750, that's not too bad. If you look at the Vixen, this is a little higher end telescope. You can see it's $1,800, more than $1,000 more. For that, you're getting a 103 millimeter aperture, basically the same. A shorter focal length, 795 millimeters. And so uh, this will give you a little wider field. And chances are the price difference may be a little better construction, most likely much better glass in the objective. Now the last number we'll look at is the focal ratio. Now if we look at this Celestron, we see it gives a number that looks a lot like the maximum aperture of a regular camera lens, f9 in this case. And that's because it's kind of a similar concept. For, for telescopes, all this focal ratio, as they call it, is, is the focal length of the scope divided by its aperture. So now if we look at this uh, Celestron, that's a 900 millimeter focal length divided by a 100 mil millimeter aperture. So obviously that's f9, like it says. If you look at the Vixen, 
795 millimeter focal length divided by 103 millimeter aperture gives you 7.7. .7. So this uh, Vixen is a slightly faster, faster scope than the Celestron. And just like with lenses, the smaller the uh, aperture number, the faster the scope. And so as you make the focal length longer of a scope, the, the uh, speed of the scope slows down. And so the longer aperture or the longer exposure you need. As you make the aperture bigger, the speed of the scope goes up and the shorter exposure you need. So none of this should sound all that surprising if you're familiar with your camera lenses. So for refractors, uh, focal ratios around f7, f8, f9, f10, somewhere in that range, that's pretty typical. Um, if you find ones faster than that, uh, that's usually because they have a wider aperture. Problem with wider apertures, uh, even though they're great for deep space photography, is they have to bend light more than with a narrow aperture. And so because of that, you could suffer more chromatic aberration in the case of refractors. Now, most telescope manufacturers aren't going to allow that. So instead, they use more expensive glass, and you really pay for it. Here's the next step up for Celestron, it's 120 millimeters aperture, 900 millimeter focal length. So the same as we saw before, that gives us a focal ratio of f7.5. So quite a bit faster scope, but you really pay for that. This is $1,550. So more than double the um, 100 millimeter focal length one. So those are the trade-offs and mass photographers, you're probably familiar with trade-offs. Now, the other thing to look for on a telescope are mounting rings. And uh, you can see this Celestron has them right here and here. And you'll find these on most of the mid to higher end telescopes. Now, the reason for this is, especially on a refractor, you're putting the telescope on the very back of it. And that puts a lot of torque on the tube. So you really need to be able to balance it. And with these rings, you can just loosen the rings, slide the whole telescope forward, and then keep it everything in balance, even with the camera on the back. You also see this bar below it. That's called a dovetail bar. And I can show you mine. So this is for the mounting rings for my telescope and its dovetail bar right here. And so uh, there's a few different designs. They're all pretty similar. But uh, this just clamps right into the tube, into the uh, mount. And even this part can also slide forward and back in most cases. So uh, if you're familiar with the Arca Swiss system for camera tripods, this is pretty much exactly like it, except a lot bigger. Wow, that's a lot about refractors, but don't worry too much because all the same concepts, the aperture, focal length, and the focal ratio, and even the subject of rings, all applies to all the other kinds of telescopes as well. So we don't have to review any of that stuff. Speaking of reflectors, let's shop for a Newtonian. And this time, let's go with Orion telescopes over at telescope.com. And here is an Orion Newtonian reflector. It's 10 inches, 254 millimeters. And it's f3.9, so it's a very fast scope. And it costs $650 US. That was the same price as the 80 millimeter refractor. So keep that in mind. Now, it doesn't tell you what the focal length is, but all you have to do is multiply the aperture, 254 millimeters, by the uh, focal ratio, f3.9, and that gives you 990 millimeters. So for $650, this is an incredible scope and an incredible value. Newtonians do tend to be the best value among all the different telescopes. But Newtonians are also the fussiest of the three. Most telescopes are set up for visual astronomy, where you look through an eyepiece. But if you're doing prime focus astrophotography, there lies the problem. Eyepieces sit a good ways behind the prime focus. But camera sensors have to be racked in a long way from where the eyepiece sits to get to the prime focus. For refractors and Cassegrains, that's no problem because their focusers have a huge focus range. But Newtonians? have focusers hanging off the side. So you can't crank the focusers in very far or you'll interfere with the light path. Or in some cases, the camera would have to be inside the tube. It's very common for people to buy a Newtonian, hook up their camera, and find they can't focus. Heartbreaking. Now my main astrophotography telescope is a Newtonian. 
And you can see the primary mirror on the back. Focuser on the side. So obviously there is a solution. More than one actually. In my case, the solution was I had to move the prime focus farther out of the scope to reach my camera. To do that, I simply moved the mirror from the end of the tube farther in a few centimeters, which pushed the prime focus out of the scope. Problem solved. Now I can't do visual astronomy anymore, but since I never do that, I don't really care. Now that's not the solution for everyone. Most Newtonians today are made out of aluminum. Mine's made of fiberglass, so my mod took about 15 minutes to do. With an aluminum tube, and in most cases the mirror is mounted outside the end of the tube, the only way to mod the tube this way is to cut the aluminum tube and then mount the mirror at the new cut point. That may be beyond what most people want to do. Another solution is to use what's called a Barlow lens. Now this is sort of an extension tube with a little lens in it. This is a pretty crappy one. Most of the ones you'd find are a lot better than this. But it can move the prime focus farther out of your scope. And you just put it into your focuser and stick your camera into that. <laughs> but wow, this is a little scary looking. It moves your camera so far out. And depending on the quality of your Barlow lens, it may make it kind of unstable and wobbly. And it's definitely putting more torque on the tube, which you really don't want. But your best solution is to buy a Newtonian specifically designed for astrophotography. And the Orion we were looking at earlier happens to be one. It's called an Astrograph. And you can see the Orion 10 inch F3.9 Newtonian Astrograph. This is a telescope whose focal point is just in the right place to put a camera. So this is exactly what you need if you want to use a Newtonian. And remember, $650 for an F3.9, 10 inch, very fast Newtonian. So this is a really great deal. Uh, if you want to spend more, here's one I just recently learned about from uh, PowerNewts.com, the Boren Simon Power Newt. And you can see eight inch, 10 inch here, $2,900. So they're pretty expensive, but they are stunning because if you look at the 10 inch, and remember you're looking at the 10 inch Orion, this is 722 millimeter focal length, F2.84, amazingly fast scope. So this is a great one if you can afford it. If you just wanna spend the $650 US on the Orion, that's a great scope. Another thing about Newtonians is that their parabolic primary mirror can cause what's called coma, which is an aberration of the stars more towards the edge of the field of view, which makes the stars look like little comets. To deal with this problem, you can use a coma corrector, which is kind of like a Barlow lens, but it doesn't bend the light so much and it doesn't affect focus so much. Another option is to get a catadioptric Newtonian. Now, you remember we talked about catadioptric cassegrains. There are catadioptric Newtonians as well, but they are kind of a specialty item. They're not easy to find. And uh, this is one of the few I found from um, Roth Valley Optics Limited in England. This is a Maxitov Newtonian, as you can see, the corrector plate on the front, the curved corrector plate. And so this, these uh, corrector plates do take care of coma. And uh, so this one, not too bad. This is a, uh, what was it? I saw before, 190 millimeters aperture, 1000 millimeter focal length for an F5.26, pretty good. And it is uh, 1,070 pounds sterling, which is about $1,600 US. But, uh, so that's a good option, but you won't find many of these and you probably won't find a great deal on any of them. Another option to reduce the effects of coma is instead of using a full frame camera, use a crop sensor camera because that'll effectively just use the sweet spot of the mirror and all the stars with coma, or at least with the worst of the coma, will be off of the edges. You can also just crop your full frame photos, but of course that's kind of a waste of storage and pixels. The last option is just not worry about coma. 
It's not a huge problem if you're just coming up to speed on astrophotography, but you probably will get comments about it. Having astrophotos without any coma shows a level of skill there that uh, you should strive for. One more thing about Newtonian telescopes is that bright stars and images taken with a Newtonian have diffraction spikes. Now, this happens because the secondary mirror is supported by these four struts, and light passing by those struts gets diffracted, and it forms these spikes. Now, personally, I like diffraction spikes. And if you look up illustrations of uh, stars, let's see what we get here in images. Uh, we have some five-pointed ones, but what else do we have? We have diffraction spikes. What else? More diffraction spikes. Uh, what else? Any more? I guess you could argue those are diffraction spikes, but um, yeah, you see them all over the place. There's some there, there's some on this uh, motion graphic, some here. People like diffraction spikes. And not only that, it's not that it's not astronomical. Hubble Space Telescope, where some of the best astronomy is being done today, isn't a Newtonian, but its secondary mirror is held by four supporting struts. So images with the HST get these spikes too. This is really just a matter of whether they bother you or not. Now let's shop for a Cassegrain. And for that, let's go to Celestron because they have this venerable C8. They have sold a lot of these. Uh, like the name implies, it's an 8 inch or 203.2 millimeter aperture, 2032 millimeter focal length. Typically, uh, Cassegrains have a very long focal length even though they're physically the shortest telescopes you can find. And that's because it, the light is folded back on itself a couple of times. And also the optics make the effective focal length longer than it really looks. Now, because the tube is so short, that means when you put a camera on the back of it, it doesn't torque the tube so much. So that's a good thing. They're also usually lighter than Newtonians and uh, refractors, depending on the sizes, of course. And another benefit of it being so short is that when you're slewing it or it's tracking, there's less of a chance that the tube will run into something, including its own tripod, which can happen with the longer tubes. Now, notice there's no rings, no mounting rings. Because these are so short, people just bolt the dovetail bar right onto it. And to adjust the balance, you just slide this bar along the mount. Now, Cassegrains aren't as cheap as an equivalent-sized Newtonian, but they're sure not as expensive as a good refractor. Also, their corrector plates take care not only of spherical aberration, but also of coma, so you don't have that to worry about. They don't have diffraction spikes in photos you take with them, if that bothers you, because the secondary mirror is, is, supported, right, is supported by the corrector plate itself, so you have none of that. And last... You can do both visual astronomy and astrophotography with one Cassegrain telescope because their focusers can rack forward and back really far. Okay, we looked at the C8 Schmidt Cassegrain. What about Maxidov Cassegrains? Like, I have one right here that I got about 10 years ago or so. You normally only see the Maxidov style on the smaller Cassegrains, like this 4-inch ones. Once you start getting to 6 inches or 8-inch Cassegrains, you're really only going to see the Schmidt Cassegrains with the flat corrector plates because it seems like the uh, Maxidov style just doesn't scale up as well as the uh, Schmidt Cassegrain style. Now let's tie things up. If you want a great telescope for astrophotography and visual astronomy, you can hardly do better than a Schmidt Cassegrain. If you want to spend a little less and don't mind dealing with a couple potential optical issues, the Newtonians are just great for this. Now what about refractors? Well, there is one problem with all reflectors, both Newtonians and Cassegrains, is that part of the light is blocked by the secondary mirror. Whereas with refractors, you just get a clear view all the way down to, without anything blocking it. So that really helps the contrast of the image in uh, refractors, which is great for planetary photography where you're trying to make out little details little subtle cloud patterns and things like that. Refractors are great for that. For solar photography, solar astrophotography, where you're taking images of the sun, including the prominences and the grain of the sun, really there's no other way to go than a refractor with a solar filter. 
solar filters are usually not big enough to cover a, uh, a cancer grain, the opening of a cancer grain. So you can build an adapter to uh, have a filter over the front of a cancer grain, but then a lot of that space is taken up by the secondary mirror. So really for solar photography, refractors are the best choice. So that's it for our look at OTAs. So now let's have a little fun by taking a look at some of the really big telescopes around the world. The Yerkes Telescope in Wisconsin is the biggest refractor in the world at 1,020 millimeters and 19,400 millimeters focal length for a focal ratio of f19. It has an achromatic lens and was finished in 1895. This is as big a refractor as you can build before the lens starts distorting under its own weight. For decades, the 200-inch Hale Telescope in Southern California was the biggest telescope on the planet with a focal ratio of f3.3. Its light path is most like a Cassegrain, but it's more complicated than that. It was finished in 1948. The largest effective optical telescopes in the world today are the twin Keck telescopes in Hawaii. Each one has a 10,000 millimeter aperture and a focal length of 1.75 really fast. By using interferometry using both Kecks at the same time, they can even get a higher resolution. The most famous telescope in the world, or around the world, is the Hubble Space Telescope. It has a 2400 millimeter aperture and is an F24 Ritchie Chrétien Cassegrain, which needs no corrector plate. Once its last gyros give out, there's no way to replace them without the space shuttles. So it'll be deorbited at that point. And last, I'm really excited about a telescope which began site construction in 2012, the Giant Magellan Telescope. It'll have seven eight meter mirrors arranged to form one image and it'll be completed in the Chilean mountains around the year 2020.